Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 431, the late Friday afternoon edition. I'm Gavin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and today's August 24th, 2018. If you look closely, he's not in a hospital bed. He's obviously not at the studio and at church. Uh, and you've obviously read his Facebook post that he's been in the hospital. He's back in the hospital. Um, George has been fighting sepsis uh, basically on and off since you returned from Israel. Uh, you are home now. Give us a, a quick update. Well, I was hospitalized for not, uh, took ill again over the last weekend. Was hospitalized for five nights, four mm -hmm. days. Uh, yeah whatever and uh, again came close to dying uh, with my kidneys and uh, whatnot all set to shut down and uh, the uh, treatment has been uh, broad spectrum antibiotics and I'm going to see a specialist on Monday in uh, in Ocala which is the nearest big city uh, to basically find out what's behind all this because they've not really identified what is the cause of this infection and they've been able to treat it, and then they said, oh good, things are looking great, and you're under control, you're getting better every day, and then boom, we have this reoccurrence. And uh, uh, it's been quite scary for my wife, quite irritating for me. Uh, well, I'm not a doctor, but infection can come from outside, you get punctured, you eat something, uh, you can't really get an infection for eating anything, but basically a puncture, uh, or in some cases, you know, high levels of stress, uh, have they found a source for you? Well, they believe that this latest outbreak was caused by high levels of stress because I have no uh, wounds on my body that would in indicate a new infection. Had some uh, particularly stressful things to do with deal with my daughters, normal, yeah. normal <laughs> young girl. Father, twins, uh, say no more. <laughs> basically essentially financial and uh, life issues mm -hmm. and they were highly stressful and on Saturday I started off after resolving this issue I preached Saturday sermon went home had a bit of a headache we had also resolved our daughter's issue and my wife took my temperature because she said I felt a little warm it was 99 well uh, it was at midnight at 2 a.m. was 102 and at 4 was 104 and at that point she took me to the hospital and she had been giving me uh, Tylenol to as a fever suppressant, and it wasn't working. And when I got to the hospital, bam, I went right back into the reg regimen of uh, IV antibiotics and CAT scans and chest x-rays. Did I have meningitis? Oh, this and that, this and that, this and that. And, and I have a, an infection, uh, origin unknown. Uh, the, look, we have a single infectious disease doctor in our county, and so I'm moving to somebody who has a little more experience little more, yes. beyond raccoon bites and uh, possums. And uh, well, we she does treat. Uh, we do get rattlesnake bites around here, but uh, I don't have a rattlesnake bite, no. so there's a little that she may not know. So we're going to the specialist. Well, when you and we've traveled a lot uh, over the last uh, ten years. I remember getting back from Tanzania. I remember in Tanzania, uh, we hung out the tiki bar eating diet or drinking diet sodas and uh, talking with all the press the whole time. And uh, the primates were isolated from us, so we didn't really have a lot of interaction. But you got sick like the last three days in Tanzania, and you were down. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, they uh, think it might have been uh, salad that was not properly washed. Yeah. That... Or, or ice cubes. Um, in other words, just just the luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. uh, but that took uh, about six weeks. But I was not as ill as I, I wasn't life threatening. I just lost a great deal of weight. It was yes. the African diet program, <laughs> uh, and you know, a good a good case of dysentery will, you know, knock off twenty pounds, give you a new lease on life. Now, this is different. So I've not been lucky with that, but it. You know, it's not malaria, thank goodness. It's not dengue fever. I mean, I've been tested for those sorts wow, of things. Wow, they, they're going for the good stuff. Um, this is the point in the show where I do, like, we have what's called viewer participation. We usually ask you to like and share and comment on the show. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, it's time to subscribe. We also have a podcast. You can find those links in the show note. 
Also, audience participation this week is to pray for George and his family. We need to certainly resolve this because uh, financially, it's not good to be in the hospital every other week. Uh, it's even more stressful on George and his family and the church. Uh, there's a, the, a whole structure and mechanism involved around George's life. It's not just Anglican Unscripted or Anglican Inc. Uh, uh, he's one of those guys that you know works the, the 70 hours and uh, loves what he does. But when it's when he's down, the whole system is down. And uh, we, we want to pray for uh, George's res- restoration to health. On to the news. Um, even though you're sick on death's bed, you post stories on Anglican Inc. We thank you for I that. Do, I, I mean, I, I get bored, Kevin. I got nothing else to do. Got nothing else to do. You know, and so we as the audience appreciate that very much. You posted a, I don't know if people have been watching it. Now, I guess the world has finally tuned in now that Trump is tweeting about it. But uh, South Africa, if you guys remember a long time ago, 30 years maybe, there was apartheid. Where 1992 is 19, when it ended. Wow. Apartheid. And uh, that's when the whites ruled uh, South Africa. It wasn't one person, one vote. And uh, it was a, a bad time politically for South Africa, uh, for, uh, actually for the, the, the continent of Africa uh, at the time was not doing so well either. And they decided... Uh, Kevin, you could say that about any point in the last 200 years I about know. Africa. Uh, uh, but go ahead. I'm sorry. But, sorry. but South Africa decided we're going to change the, the laws, and uh, Mel- Nelson Mandela came to power. Uh, Archbishop Tutu, who was an a- Anglican archbishop at the time, uh, was also influenced on all this. It says, we're going to have one person, one vote, which instantly made uh, the black people in South Africa um, powerful. What Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Tutu said is we're not going to relive the past. We're not going to become our enemies. We're not going to storm the farmlands and retake the property from the white man. We're going to, you know, do this the Christian way. Um, And we're going to do this thoughtfully. We do not want to become our enemy. And that worked, George, for the last 30 years. That thought, that process we're not going to become the enemy, but there has just been so much corruption at the government levels and uh, at the civilian levels within South Africa that it was just a matter of time before somebody came to power and said, you know, those white people still have a lot of land that the government, I'm sorry, <clears throat> we could give to uh, black farmers. Why don't we just take it? And this was the big fear 30 years ago that this would just one day turn into uh, a minor revolution in the country or a little civil war within the country. And we're we're now to that point, George. We're to the point where um, the current government is willing to undo the promises of the past. Yeah, the uh, South African political class is akin to Russia under the Yeltsin years. It's a kleptocracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, The leaders of the government make hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars through sweetheart deals with the government's uh, contracts. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly corrupt system. Corruption is endemic on the African, South African scale. Uh, however, um, South African businesses do overall, you know, turn out products, the farms do well, and so and system would work. However, because of the government's mismanagement of the economy, the poor have not been lifted out of their poverty and violence has gotten worse and worse and worse. And some people on the far left of the African uh, political scene have said, have basically decided we need somebody to blame. And here's the joke of, uh, they're blaming the Jews and the white man. They're saying, it's not, you know, the time may come and we will have to slit the throats of these people to take what is back, what is ours. Now, some of these white farmers have been on the same land for 400 years. And you can get into the history of there's nobody there, this and that. If it's going to go back to anybody, give it to the uh, Hottentots. But the the point is, the radical, uh, the radical, what was once the Kuts, have now moved into control of the government. And the state is overturning a constitution to allow the seizure of white land, just as what happened in Zimbabwe. And we all know what happened to Zimbabwe. 
It went from one of the wealthiest nations in Africa, high standard of living, high productivity, fairly nice place, to the Brett, to one of the most devastated, destroyed countries in the world, in a generation. It's and South Africa has gone down that path. Yeah, yeah. South Africa now. Well, and I, I don't remember any time that it was safe to live outside a gated community in South Africa. This is just my my 30 year perspective, whether you're white or black, uh, if you're middle class or upper middle class or rich, you live in a gated community because the um, the violence is just horrid. Um, the, the drive by shootings, but, the robberies, the carjackings. Um, now, I, I think Kevin though, I, I think we want to broaden this because being a farmer is a pretty, it's, it's difficult right now in Africa because yeah. If you go to East Africa, Uganda, Kenya, you have what are called the land mafias, politically well-connected politicians and military leaders, essentially evicting people from their land and coming up with title deeds for lands that have been in, you know, sort of continuous inhabitants by the local people for generations. And you basically got people going to the county clerk's office and recording property deeds when there have never been any deeds before. And people being expropriated from their land in East Africa and in Nigeria, we have black farmers being killed by black tribesmen, uh, by black herders. And the, the Fulani were coming in and killing farmers to take over the land for cattle grazing. And we're having white farmers in South Africa being murdered by blacks uh, because they're white, because people think they're rich and they have money hidden in their homes. Well, this is where this becomes an Anglican story. In Nigeria, where this is happening, where the, the herdsmen are, are killing farmers, Justin Welby has spoken up. The Anglican Church in Nigeria has spoken up. Uh, the world has, you know, largely arose and said, stop, this is wrong, you can't do this. They've uh, spoken to the leadership in Nigeria. Uh, they've condemned the leader of Nigeria for all this. But if you go down just a little further... And that's true also of Kenya and Uganda. Mm -hmm where the church has stood in solidarity with the people under attack. Uh, you do a nexus search right now of Justin Welby in South Africa and look for any statement about what's happening down there, crickets, nothing. In fact, even the church in South Africa, the Anglican church down there and other denominations for that matter, nothing. You know, because... Well, the, Arch <laughs> well, the Archbishop of South Africa has a, uh, a blog and a news feed where he tweets about his ideas and he we recently was in Durban and gave a speech at the 90th birthday party of Chief Budalese, the leader of the Inkata Freedom Party, the Zulu leader. And he apologized for Archbishop Tutu's being mean to Chief Budalese 30 years ago because Chief Budalese tried to strike a deal for the Zulus with the apartheid regime. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see a word one about the return of government racism? where race, color of your skin, determines uh, how you're treated by the state. Has or, the church the spoken church. up? Yeah. No, of course not. Well, now, South Africa, the South African church has, it's really in dreadful shape, but I mean, well, as an, it's the worst, it's, it's doing worse than just about anybody else in the continent of Africa among Anglicans. It is also the most corrupt. You and I joke about India, uh, churches in India and stuff like that. South Africa is as equal as it gets to uh, its corruption. Now, we have South African Anglican viewers, and sometimes when I say this, they get a little angry with Kevin, a little angry with George, but they'll send a two or three emails. The other 30 or 40 uh, listeners send us, yeah, you're right. This is what my bishop did. This is what my... No, it's not, you're absolutely right, Kevin. Yeah. There are some good dioceses. Mm -hmm. There are some great people. But let me give an example of corruption. The Diocese of Umzavubu, which I visited in the 90s. I spent some time in Durban and Peter Maritzburg in 1998, 1999. I was there almost eight months, no, six months, mm -hmm. uh, in those two towns. And I would go down and visit Jeff Davies, the Bishop of Umzavubu. And so I know those places. Well, his successor, uh, was accused of corruption by his clergy and the South African church was going to send in somebody to investigate and wouldn't you know it, the day before the auditors arrived the cathedral and all the records burned down. Uh, Whoa. The bishop, oh, 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 
What are the chances? <laughs> what are the chances of that? Uh, lightning strike in this perfectly dry <laughs> desert weather. Uh, or the Bishop of Pretoria. Um, the South African church is heading in a number of its leaders are, are they're aping the culture of the politics around them, of the big man being in charge. And because he's in charge, he's got to take care of his clients. And the only way he can do that is to siphon off money from the church. Um, that's the way African politics works. And in, some, and in South Africa, we're seeing that replicated in the church. And that is not the church of Desmond Tutu, Trevor, Hutt, Trevor Huddleston, and uh, the, the heroes of the apartheid era. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the suck up to the government church that we've had under the last two archbishops in Cape Town. Well, you talked about Zimbabwe. I remember Roland Williams speaking about Zimbabwe. I, I remember you know him trying to have a church level influence on what was happening in that country. And I don't hear nothing about Justin Welby. And this, this embarrasses me, you know, because this becomes internal racism again within the Anglican Church. Aaron, I think our viewers may to pick a bone with us because if you do a Google's news search, Justin Welby, South Africa, you will learn that he has asked the Archbishop of South Africa to be in charge of the program at the Lambeth Conference in 2020. So, friends, I think we may be technically... I I'm sorry. But see, here, here's the joke. If you're a friend of Justin's, if you're on board the uh, happy clappy, uh, let's uh, kumbaya, let's all sing peace, love, and happiness, you can get away with murder at home. Remember when they appointed the uh, primate, uh, the moderator of the Church of South India to this uh, co committee after that Canterbury primates not meeting? Uh, well, the guy was under a criminal investigation for theft. You would think they would have some better people to pick. But no, here was somebody who was going to sign whatever communique Josiah Daiwoferon came up with. And uh, I'm being jaded. I'm no, sorry. no, 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 no. I'm trying to remember, is it Brian Williams or Tom Brokaw? For our next story. We'll get to that. Um, let's move on to our next story. I'm doing Google searches while we're talking about doing Google searches. My apologies to the audience. Uh, let's move on. So we covered South Africa enough to get some email on that. If you have any comments about our stories, just go to the YouTube channel, click on the video, and go down a little bit and write your comments. We read them all. Sometimes we uh, comment on them uh, on the air if uh, it reaches uh, a certain level, and we'll actually talk about a comment in a minute. Um, George, remember, it wasn't 10 years ago, we used to hear Bush lies, people die. You remember that, right? Yes. Bush lied, people died. And that was all about the Iraq uh, war at the time and, uh, you know, just a little dishonesty within the CIA and other uh, government agencies causing us to go into this war. Um, and to me, I always got the lie part, you know, being dishonest can hurt a lot of people. And uh, so when I see stories about bishops uh, making things up or lying or being a little less than truthful, uh, I sometimes want to talk about it on the show. And uh, whether or not this is a good idea, I don't know. But I'm not going to... Here, let me just say this way. Bishop lies, Jews die. Now, that's kind of harsh, right? Yeah. <laughs> what am I talking about, George? Well, I don't think you're going to get a Christmas card from Boston this, nope, this year. probably not yet. <laughs> Gail Harris, Suffolk Bishop of, of uh, Massachusetts, at the General Convention, gave personal testimony about her experiences in Israel and the West Bank, where she recounted atrocities committed by the Israeli army and police that she witnessed. Well, various Jewish groups investigated and said there's no truth to these claims whatsoever, that she lied. She's making stuff up as she's going along. She's making, she's trying to basically take a an opinion about the illegitimacy of the Israeli uh, relations to the Palestinians, and with some lies, get the Episcopal Church to back disinvestment. Yeah, and that's what this was all about: whether or not the Episcopal Church should have investments in Israel, and she should have stood up and gave testimony, personal testimony of what she eyewitnessed. Now. She uh, 
we covered this story, Jewish groups covered this story, pointing out, and we also covered the fact that she slandered the state of Poland, uh, where she basically, she must listen to NPR or something for her news because she just totally, she said Poland had criminalized discussion of the Holocaust. And no, Poland had criminalized blaming Poland for the German Holocaust in Nazi-occupied Poland. Poland was quite, is quite defensive about the fact that they're the only nation that did not collaborate during the war. The French, the Belgians, Russians, all collaborated to some extent, the Ukrainians, the Poles did not collaborate. That's a different issue, but she said, so she got it totally wrong. And then she went on and slandered the, she slandered the Poles. And coming at it from a direction, different direction, she slandered the Jews. And last week, she apologized. And what I think was so striking was that the Bishop of Massachusetts apologized with her in an appendum. So I think somebody may have sat down in Boston with the Bishop of Massachusetts and said, look, you can't just let this lie. You've got to do something because this woman is spewing falsehoods, claiming to this. And she apologized for having inadvertently hurt some people's feelings. She apologized for having been caught. And then she gave, you know, oh, I was I was misinformed, but, but, but you apologized you about you what you saw. you saw. It's weird. Your, mm -hmm. eyes, your eyes have deceived you. Now, we know from Scripture that's possible. Uh, so who knows? Who knows? And, and so the thing is that people – We've got a lot of comments about after the Poland story and after we published our story about Israel, we said, "Well, this we know this woman. This is just who she is. She, you know, will take she'll take something and just blow it up and make add color and facts and stories to make a good story even better." And she got caught this time so and that, was did, forced to apologize. Isn't there another female African American? Uh, bishop from that same area <laughs> years ago, wasn't she? Uh, Bar Barbara Harris was the, her predecessor, who yeah. was the first African American woman bishop. Yeah. Barbara Harris. And Bar Bishop Harris was noted for her salty language. She, we can't repeat this as a children's room. <laughs> um, yeah. And this bishop's name was Barbara Harris. And this is Gail Harris. Okay, because you called her Barbara at the beginning. I want to be sure we have the name correct. Well, my apologies. No, that's all right. I, it didn't dawn on me until I was trying to uh, put the two and two together. The, the story we just did was about Gail Harris, and Barbara was the, the predecessor to, uh, to Gail. It, it happens. There's a lot of names that are really too close in the Episcopal and Anglican churches. Um, George, we're going to talk a little bit about a controversial story. Uh, earlier this week, I got a phone call, and it went to voicemail before I could reach it, and it was about a person who was very upset about something she had read on Anglican Inc. We had uh, reposted a story by uh, uh, Father Michael Hyde. Michael Hyde. Yep. Uh, he had attended the Forward and Faith Conference down in Texas. and Fort he, Worth. Fort Worth, and he posted a story. And the story goes, uh, quotes uh, Bishop uh, Watlin in something he said. And I'll, I'll let you bring people to speed. But comments sometimes get to the level where George and I will talk about them. And this one deserves talking about. What happened, George? Well, Bishop William Watlin uh, is at the Ford and Faith Conference, which is about, which is about 50 true believers. Mm -hmm gathered around the issue of opposition to women, clergy, and Anglo-Catholicism, which uh, T.S. Eliot reminds us is the Trotskyism of the Christian world, uh, which I always find interesting, but that's a I different know. story. Well, uh, 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 I need to, to admit my bias here. I, I'm friends with the Forward and Faith people. I love the Forward and Faith people. And uh, Anglican TV will, yeah, and has always been uh, a, a supporter of, of uh, uh, people who are serious about theological things. And I mangled my no little quote. It was George Orwell <laughs> yes, who said this. Let, let's start this Not part. Let, let's start this over here. Three, two. We'll do this whole section over. Okay. Three, two, one. All right. Now, I mentioned before that we're going to talk about a comment uh, on that it didn't appear at first anywhere except my voicemail. A person from the Midwest uh, called in and left a voicemail uh, 
uh, is this Kevin? And she goes on to describe what she read in Anglican Inc. And I was traveling with mom and dad at the time, so I didn't have any time at all. You forwarded it to me. <laughs> yeah, I forwarded the, the voicemail to George. And uh, George, you took care of all this, and you you tried to uh, you know be fair to both sides and and talk about what happened. Let's get, give a little background here, and I need to admit up front my bias. Uh, this is a story about Forward and Faith, and I love all the, the clergy and bishops and lay people in the Forward and Faith movement. They're awesome people. Um, that's my bias. I, I love them all. Uh, and so when we talk about the story, please uh, it, uh, it, 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 let me acknowledge my bias. They had a Forward and Faith meeting. Uh, they have one every year, and they invite some of the great uh, people from Forward and Faith over the years. Bishop Wantland was there and uh, gave a little talk, and in that he described things that uh, were perfect for that group. Uh, this article that we reposted on Anglican Inc. that this person commented on has that quote in it, and it was written by the the article was written by Father Michael Height and reposted on Anglican Inc. And this is where you can pick up the story. Well, Michael Height quoted William Wantland as uh, describing the Anglo-Catholic understanding of what happens at Holy Communion, mm -hmm. that the priest is the icon of Christ and Christ, and, and the church is the bride and bridegroom of Christ. And if you have a female priest, uh, iconically what you're doing, I can, the iconography of that is a lesbian wedding. If you're having a woman marrying the, the church, that's a woman and a woman. That's a lesbian church. And in the conversations within Ford and Faith, that is a good line, but it's not shocking. It's, well, no, it is for shocking a, outside of Ford and Faith. For, but for, a, for an ACNA female priest to read, an ACNA bishop saying that, she uh, was very exercised saying this was borderline sexual harassment. And I said, you know, I uh, email correspondent with her on this point, and I said, you know, uh, I'm confident in Michael Height being an excellent reporter, and this is entirely within Bishop Wantland's uh, way of thinking, so I don't doubt this is true. It's to but the at, point, and, and he's speaking to the people who uh, this wouldn't be a controversial uh, statement before them. But... Where, and I, I, I said, now here, if you really disagree with him, this is what I would do if I were you. Mm -hmm. Speak to him, not with beginning with accusations of sexual harassment, but saying, you know, I disagree with you and try to have a dialogue. Because if you come at him with a hammer, this is going to reinforce everything that he thinks about women clergy. Now, why is this so funny is that we have three, lot, the three most heavily commented articles in the past weeks or so, have dealt with the divide between Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals and Charismatics within the ACNA. We had, the same week we had a sermon by Gavin, uh, we post his sermons on Anglican Inc. He talked about the, the Eucharist and he propounded a Roman Catholic understanding of what happens at the Mass. And then we also had a story from West Africa where a Ghanaian Anglican clergy leaders said, look, people, we need to stop praying for the dead. Our prayers are not going to inch people out of purgatory. You're saved by faith, not by our works and praying for the dead. So the women clergy, the what happens at the Eucharist? Is it their real presence or is it transubstantiation or consubstantiation or is this entirely a Zwinglian thing? And do we have prayers for the dead? good old traditional Anglican <laughs> things that we've thought about for 150 years. <laughs> 300 years. The AC, and sometimes people criticize me by saying, George, why do you bring up AC, Episcopal stories for the ACNA viewership? It's because you guys need a common enemy. That's right. Because otherwise, it, the, the line between when you turn on each other is so, it's there, folks, and we saw it this week. Yeah. It is. A, I mean, this is what we talked about, you know, on and off again for the last ten years, bringing you know Bob Duck and bringing together this these kittens, the, these cats that just want to be on their own, love it on their own. Some of them are feral. Uh, bring them all into this little package called the ACNA, and you see this once in a while. It never gets so bad 
um, that somebody gets up and says, I'm, I'm done, I'm leaving. But you know, within that is kind of the machination of what is Christianity? Listening, forgiveness, you know, talking this out, loving thy brother uh, in Christ. You know, I see everybody hard at work, as much as they disagree, trying to work together. And I know it's hard, but I've seen some awesome things in the, in the last 10 years. I, one of the, the, the coolest things I've seen on the bishop level is watching bishops correct each other or correct clergy under them um, transparently. Uh, I was at a uh, an event in Chicago. I'm not going to tell you the date because I don't want you to, to figure out who this person was. But there was a bishop there who was listening to a, a, a prayer by a visiting priest. And this priest, was his theology was gone. It was off kilter. It was uh, South American uh, name and claimant. And this bishop got up went over to this clergy's bishop and says, we need to correct him on this. Uh, they, they did this, you know, not in front of everybody, but behind the scenes, and I heard about it later, and I was so proud. I'm like, that's how you do it. You know, and uh, this clergy apologized for it, and it was, it was awesome. So I see how it works, even though it's really hard to have this whole a bundle of kittens working together. I see ACNA trying very hard to make it work. It's hard. It's supposed to be hard. Well, my counsel to the uh, car, our correspondent, uh, to the to one to the person who wrote to us, contacted us, was that approach the person with whom you disagree with patience, forbearance, humility, and love, because if you approach them with anger or hostility or make demands upon them. You're not going to change things at all, yeah. and um, you're not going to build up the body of Christ. But if you approach things in love and unity and try to reason together, then per then that church will survive, and you'll go forward, and you may find a resolution in time. Um, but if you will, the I want conformity to my way of thinking rather than I, I pray that we seek the truth, God's truth. It's the way of the internet, it's the way of, of Twitter, of yeah. people treating church adversaries as, as if they're strangers with odd handles on Twitter so that you can blast. And the problem is that that doesn't work in the parish, it doesn't work in the denomination. Um, and it, I am an evangelical. I don't think anybody has any question about that. Yet I have a wonderful relationship with the Anglo-Catholics uh, in ACNA and the two or three left in the Episcopal Church. Because open, transparent, I affirm and I love and I support their ministries and I think they are honored brothers and sisters in Christ and I believe that's reciprocated to me. We may not agree on the real presence. We may not agree on prayers for the dead, on so and so and so and so. Yet we have been able to work together in building the kingdom because we put egos and demands that people think like me or you to one side. But that's, that's just me. That's well, it, it's us. You know, we, you know, as observers and reporters in, in this day and age, we get to see what doesn't work in the church, and there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work denomination by denomination in uh, Christ Church on this earth, there's a lot that doesn't work. There's a lot that hasn't worked from day two. You want to go back in scripture and you can read about the stuff that did not work. And it's amazing to see all the things they're trying today has been tried before. Why are you trying to continue to do the stuff that doesn't work? However, George, in our observations, in our travels, we get to watch it when it does work and that's fun to report on and and friends it's never does anybody any good when you personalize things mm. um, and I'm I've been guilty of this too but you know I got to know Gene Robinson very very well there are some commendable things there's some not so commendable things but you could say that about anybody but when you made but when the issue became the person of Gene Robinson 
rather than what he was preaching and the life he was living, then at that point there was no way we could go forward mm -hmm. because it was either this man must die or this man must be celebrated and is a hero. And when neither way was the way forward. Mm -hmm. when, so God has... Uh, yeah. Wow. God has given the Episcopal Church great opportunities to learn how to do things right. It sure does. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 341 of Anglican Unscripted. 431 of Anglican Unscripted. Uh, I'm like you, George. I can't believe we have recorded 431 episodes. And I can't believe people watch it. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs>